Okay, so I love the '80s. Would like to ask you. Okay. So, rappers delight. Ra rappers delight. I have to pass on because it's too. It was too early for me. Okay. I should pass on it. Okay. Um, remember the show? That's incredible. No. Okay. Uh, 1982, Pac-Man. Did you play Pac-Man? I played Pac-Man. Uh, I don't think I played that much. I think even though I didn't know what else was to become of video games, it kind of felt kind of stagnant to me. But, you know, now the level's faster. It wasn't my, I was a pole position guy. I was a pole position guy. Never made it past the qualifying heat. But, when uh, you played Pac-Man, was it a Miss or Mr. Pac-Man? Uh, I think it was Mr. I don't know. What was the difference between Miss Pac-Man? She had, a she had a bow, but I don't know what that did. She was a little more indecisive in the maze area. A little more indecisive in the corners. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, a little more guilt after losing. Um, what do you know, remember? I got them all day. Miss Pac-Man didn't really want to... No, I'm um, What do you remember about Hall and Oates? Hall and Oates, uh, I should pass on, because <laughs> all I really remember is that the, the tinier one kind of freaked me out a little bit, so we should move on. Okay. Raiders of the Lost Star. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I, I still, we, 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 I'm, I still caught that on okay. video, so I don't have any, like, first it was this, and then Raiders of the Lost Ark came um, out. What's your family, what do you remember watching cable television? Cable television. I remember with cable television, we had this box that was on top of the TV, and it was a push-button box, and it had this big row of buttons and three tiers of kind of controlling which row that corresponded to, and I just remember the fastest channel serving, even to this day, could be done by going... <laughs> Like that. Now, now you gotta do it like this, and now you got digital satellite, and you gotta wait for loading, loading, loading. I just remember this. <laughs> no, that was the best. When's the first time you remember watching MTV? Um, I remember sitting up waiting for Thriller to come on. I always wanted to catch it from the beginning. I remember wanting to catch Thriller from the beginning, and I, f I finally did. And it was Thriller, and it was it was every breath you take. And actually, no, it was wrapped on your finger. I think may have been even first, and uh, just even the sound of that, da, 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 you know, that delay thing. It just sends me back to, you know. Did you watch it for like hours on MTV? I used to watch it for hours, yeah. There was a moment when MTV really had no qualifications for what they would play because they just didn't have enough to fill 24 hours, which was great because I think there was like a Charlie Daniels concert and there was a Herbie Hancock concert and I thought that, I thought that was pretty, pretty respectable. Uh, moving on to 1983. Here we go. War Games. War Games. War Games was my movie because it was a guy with a computer doing more than you could actually do with a computer. And uh, I really liked the idea of like the whole modem thing before modems were really around. So I, I, I kind of identified with Matthew Broderick in that. Could you uh, do the, remember the line from Joshua's, would you like to play? Would you like to play a game? And then you select thermonuclear war and uh, you know, now War Games would be completely different because he'd be sidetracked by porn. Did yeah. you, did you, when you were growing up, did you have any friends that were like computer geeks? No, I, I was really the guy growing up in the 80s, like, taking apart Walkmans and building bombs. Like, it's horrible to say now. I mean, it's really horrible to say, but when you're a kid, you would just take stuff apart and build bombs. Anybody, do you know what I'm talking about? Am I the only, okay, good. I just had to make sure that at least one person knew what I was talking about. Uh, I don't really know what happened after that. You're pretty one, young when you watched War Games. Did it, did it scare you? Maybe no, you no, I didn't. I, I did. You know what? I could probably stand to watch War Games again and really kind of under, understand the kind of more subtle aspects of it. But you know what? I, you know what? I didn't understand Three's Company. I never knew that uh, John Ritter, Jack Tripper, was feigning homosexuality. I didn't know it. I just thought he was, here's that goofy guy getting, you know, stuck in a yoga position again. And uh, I remember now, I'm like, I got to go back and watch it all. And every time I watch it, I see, you know, you see, you see those, um, those Don Knotts looks. <laughs> and you realize that that's what they're all about. I just thought it was just errant goofiness. One last question on the War Games front. Did you have a favorite scene? A favorite scene from War Games? Oh, I, you know, I like the, the whole idea of the computer playing itself and losing. I thought that was a pretty cool. Not like anybody learned anything from that movie in terms of, you know, computers running the world, but that's all right. Okay, what do you remember about David? Oh, and the guy going, you gotta go to the back door. Whoever that guy is, can we show a still of that guy? That guy right there, he was in a little, little movie called uh, Midnight Madness. It was a scavenger hunt movie with a young Michael J. Fox. Yeah, and he was in the motorcycle gang of nerds. Maybe we can get that clip courtesy of 20th Century Fox or whatever. Yeah. Um, David Bowie comes out with um, 83. 
Modern Love, Let's yeah. Dance, China Girl. Tell me what you think about um, Bowie. I, I, it never, Bowie never, uh, never really kind of saturated m my head at all musically, but going back to it now, I, I kind of got into Bowie through Stevie Ray Vaughan, who I know played guitar on those records. And uh, So I just remember, I remember Bowie more from Labyrinth. Mm. You know, that's kind of what I remember him from. Okay, what of these toys do you have something to say about? Okay. Glowworms, Transformers, Voltron, or Care Bears? I have, I, 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 ha I had a glow worm. They, I, ha I honestly had a glow worm. Uh, what was in it? But I don't really know what to say about it. I think I just kind of had it. I, you know what? I didn't really have, I didn't really have a uh, partisan line gender-wise over toys when I was growing up. You know, I had Care Bears kind of going at, going at the Decepticons with the Autobots. It was kind of like a UN. It was like a, like a Toy Box United Nations. And if I had gotten like a, you know, a My Little Pony maybe once in a moment of, you know, indiscretion, uh, you know, My Little Pony was sent there maybe as kind of like a mole for the Decepticons. You know? What do you remember about the Care Bears? Um, was there an enemy in the Care Bears? There was. There was. The only, I, I, I was like Barbie because Barbie had no enemy. I, you know, Barbie was the only person to have an enemy. Well, I thought that was, Bar b b b are, you, are you, you agreeing with me? Yeah. Okay, good. I was like, who's Barbie's nemesis? You know, food. Yeah. No, Barbie, see, I, I always had toys growing up, and I never wanted, I never wanted to have battles. I wanted to have, like, like block parties, you know? And so I remember I, and all the toy games went the same. You'd have your headquarters under a chair, they'd have their headquarters under a chair, and then it always started the same. You'd fly your guy over headquarters. Look, your guy's over headquarters. And then there was a fight, and then there was a moment you have to stop and go, okay, who's going to win this one? My guy's winning. Okay, good. And you get back into it again. Do you, did you have a Teddy Ruxpin doll? I never had a Teddy Ruxpin. Did it freak you out the whole No, you know, I'm, my, my mom and dad never gave me, like, the super high-end, like, almost animatronic toys. That was always, like, like, my neighbors down the street had the Teddy Ruxpin and all the stuff that you had to charge into the wall. I, I kind of had... I still have the Transformers. And the Transformers were cool because, um, well, they weren't cool for this reason, but on the TV show, they would go, <laughs> and you would want to be just like the TV show, except it took you like 45 seconds to, feel like, to put the Transformer back. So you'd go, <laughs> like for an hour. <sighs> Done. And before, you know, the table would be covered in spit and you'd be tired anyway. Um. Born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. What do you uh, I don't really have super uh, intense memories of it. Okay. Uh, Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun? That was my first. Cindy Lauper Girls Just Want to Have Fun was my first 45 single. It was, it was my first 45, and uh, it still sounds good, I promise you. Because I kind of uh, allude to it musically every once in a while in my shows, and it still gets people going. Wow. Yeah. And well, think about the sentiment of Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Seriously. That's pretty direct. I mean, the 80s had some music that was really no holds barred in terms of the message. You know, we're not going to take it by Twisted Sister. People still respond to primary messages. You know, Sarah McLaughlin writes, I will remember you, and it will take you down faster than any 20-word chorus ever can. And the 80s was cool for that. You know, we, like, we're not going to take it. What other sentiment could there be? And so girls just want to have fun you know, is about as direct as it could possibly be, you know? What do you remember the first time you saw the video? Um, I remember going, there's Lou Albano. <laughs> who was actually, yeah, who was a crossover at that time from wrestling that I, in which I was, a, I was a big fan of. Okay. Um, we are the world, USA for Africa. Yeah. What do you remember about that? I remember, that was kind of my first introduction to, it was, one, it was in that formative moment for me with music, and I remember uh, thinking that everybody held the headphones with just one phone to their ear and sang into a microphone, and then kind of that was my, I think that was, for people my age, that was the pantomime for singing for a while, was this. The song, did it get you all warm and fuzzy inside? Um, I don't remember because I'm so sick of it now, that I really don't remember what it was like because it's a melody that's been etched so deeply into your mind that you don't remember not hearing it. Even though you're sick of it, when you think back, you think back. If you just hold on, that was the best part. The and then Michael Jackson, yeah, that was the coolest part. Was da -da 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 -da. Michael Jackson sells that part because it's kind of like not, it's not foreign to Michael Jackson to sing that kind of part. But if we just hold on, da -da 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 -da. Woo. anyone else sit out to you make Bruce Springsteen sound great in that? Kenny Rogers was in there, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he didn't, but um, uh, <laughs> 
I, I, don't, I just remember Michael ja Michael Jackson is just the baddest thing going. St I mean, the thing is, if you listen to Off the Wall and, uh, and, and Thriller, save for the videos, which actually I think demusicify the album because it turns the album into a soundtrack. But if you listen to those records, they're unmatched in terms of energy and performance. And there's records coming out this year that still try to um, kind of yes. take from take from, I, I'm not saying anything, but they take from, uh, from that thing that, that we just got so close. Michael Jackson got, has gotten the closest to it, and no one's, no one's come closest since. It's almost like, you know. Now, was, you're a, a hot-blooded young male growing up in the 80s, so you must have uh, had some feelings about Tiffany and Debbie Gibson. I did. I always knew from the get-go that, that, that Debbie Gibson was my kind of, the thing I was going to champion. Because you either liked one or the other. There was a party line. and. Well, so I don't know. I just there wasn't room for both. I don't know what that means. It's like you know, matter can only exist in one plane. So Debbie was was your girl. Debbie was my girl because she was producing all our stuff, and they kind of made it known that or Deborah. I'm sorry. I want to stay current, even though we're talking about the past. Uh, I just remember looking up to her in terms of like a writer because she wrote her own stuff. You know. And looking at her as a guy. Who was hotter, Tiffany? It's very hard to see Debbie Gibson as a guy because she's so womanly. <laughs> but, in your, <laughs> but if you had to think as a young man, uh -huh. you're, you're sitting around your friends and they're like, dude, who's hotter, Tiffany or Debbie Gibson? Oh, Debbie Gibson, by far. Hotter than Tiffany. Was that? Oh, hot, definitely hotter than Tiffany. Debbie Gibson has a confidence uh, that, that, that I exuded. Who do you think had, did a better job of su surviving their post, their teen years? Their, their careers after their teen years. Debbie Gibson, absolutely. All right. uh, you know, I think it's cool. I think I think some people are just determined just determined to do what they do, no matter what capacity it's in. And I'm not taking away from Tiffany, but I just don't know enough about it. <laughs> 1986, big year for the Cosby Show. Yes, the Cosby Show is one of the most important shows ever filmed for television ever. And there's a, there's a couple reasons why. Number one, because it's probably the most truthful display of a family unit. And my, Bill Cosby, black man, totally different way of life, in, in, the, in the show, reminds me of my father because of his care. And the man's care, you can see the fact that he's caring for the people around him, uh, not because they're playing as kids, but they are kids. So it's this really earthful kind of, just really incredible care. And because of that, and because the show is done with such heart, I guess they do this. Um, I can still watch it, and it's the most relaxing thing in the world. And it's the only show that you can smell. When you, when you watch The Cosby Show, it's so um, effective in everything it's trying to do that you can smell dinner cooking from the kitchen. And you just can, because they, 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 it comes across so homey that you can just smell dinner after school, and you can feel that there's homework to do, and that there's another day of school the next morning. It's just unbelievable in, in terms of art how they've managed to do it. Excellent. So on that, um, also 1986, a couple of movies were big. Tell me which ones uh, you would want to speak on. Well, you can only choose one if you'd like. Top Gun. Top Gun, I, I, remember, uh, I remember the song. There were a couple. There was Highway to the Danger Zone, which I would put on a lot. I got the, got the record from the library, and Danger Zone was pretty much probably the most badass that Kenny Loggins got in, in terms of pure badassness. Um, because there's some badass poo music that came out later on. I don't mean poo, P-O-O, -O, I mean P-O-O-H. Um, but I remember there was a kiss in Top Gun, there was a shadowy tongue kiss that I remember as a kid. Gave me um, a tingle that I didn't really know what it was. I mean, I still don't. What was it? <laughs> um, Joshua Tree, 1987. Yeah, uh, I didn't really discover Joshua Tree until later on, but wow, you know. Uh, um, I remember, I just remember those songs at the time, uh, which was what all songs should do in making me feel like I wish I was older, I wish I was bigger, I wish I was stronger, and I wish that I could do everything that I dreamed that I could do at that one moment. And that really is what music is supposed to do, and it still does. When you hear When the Streets Have No Name, especially with that video, which is perfectly paired because it's that kind of defiance, you know? All those singles that came off, with the exception of... Um, with or without you, are very defiant. It's the, it's the sound of like, of like um, intelligent defiance, you know. And so I remember just wanting to be five times as big as I was, you know. Um, Which later happened because. You know, 
I'm actually nice eight feet tall. Growing pains. Yeah, I, I, growing pains was okay. I always found it a little boring. It was a little too, it was a little too unrealistic. A little too psychological. Maggie, you know, a little too psychological for me. A little too goody goody for me. So you didn't find the Seaver family to really be. Well, I don't know. I mean, it was it was it was interesting for a while. Kirk Hammon, Fox, Fox. Was a pop. Uh, pre pre mind swap movie pre father son mind swap movie era, it's great. For family, that, for show that was family was so wholesome and the show was so good. Did you find it interesting that Kirk Cameron's best friend's name was Boner? I think we all remember Boner. Yeah, um, I, I did. I you know, I don't think you could get away with it now, which kind of says something about what direction we're kind of moving into. Um, never gonna give you a video by Rick Ash. Never gonna carry you up. Uh, it's kind of. Uh, Nothing to say about it. Okay. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, nothing to say about it. I mean, it's fun, but I don't, I, don't, I, don't th I, don't I don't think it's... I don't know if I, could, if I was old enough to understand its relevance to anything. You certainly weren't, probably weren't old enough to understand the Rob Lowe's sex scandal? A little bit, but not, not to the point where I'd be like, ooh, like this, ah. <laughs> you know? You're too young to, to understand the ramifications of it now. It's now, it seems like in your life, everything you do is either like, or ooh. You know, it's almost that it's come down to those two things, either whoo or ooh, and never like, you know, it's either you just barely made it or you didn't. You know? um, I'm going to go back for a little bit. The Gap broke out big in 1985. Were you ever into The Gap? I was not into The Gap. Uh, I think that more fashionable than the clothes from The Gap were the bags from The Gap. If you brought your gym clothes to school in a Gap bag, that was the stat. That's like rolling up in a Bentley when you had your Gap bag. I had like, you know, the stop and shop paper bag and the kids with the Gap bag just twirling around, you know, with, on the string. Hey, what's up? I never had that going on, but. So you, you know. do you remember the, the ad Paul and Paul with you Yeah, but that was later on than, wasn't that later than? So it was 85, it kind of began. Well, then they must have brought it back for a couple of years yeah. last, a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, the Gap bag was the status symbol. So that you, but you, were, you yourself weren't, like, you weren't wearing those colored t-shirts. I didn't have it going on. I didn't have the V-neck sweater. The V-neck sweater was just, I guess, the, I guess the thing. I still, I had the, um, I got into hypercolor shirts. You don't have hypercolor shirts on your list, do you? No. Ooh. Let me tell you, there was this era in the 80s, I think it was like 88, 89, which was the I want people to touch me era, which consisted of uh, the hypercolor shirts, which men wore, men, guys, kids wore, because it would make girls want to come up and go, ooh, can I try? Which would have girls slide their hand up your shirt and do this. Then there were the pumps. Well, because, you know, it responds to your heat. Then there were the pumps, which girls would love to come up and pump your shoes. Oh, it happened. It was a hands-on time. People would pump your shoes. And then, at the same time, we had crew cuts so that girls would come up and go, can I feel? And you always got all the attention the first day back from a haircut that you were getting your head rubbed. Of course, after that, you were stuck with a crew cut. But you had the crew cut and the pumps and the hypercolor shirt, and you were just hands-on all day. You were like, you know. Do you remember swatch watches? I do. Did you have a swatch? I had a swatch, and, uh, and then I had the swatch guard. It's like insurance for your $30 watch, the Swatch Guard. You know, protected against after school impacts, you know, book jobs. And a book job, is that a regional term or do you, ever, do you know what a book job is? A book job is when you had all your books slammed out of your hand. John Mayer comes with a glossary. <laughs> and I remember uh, I got it stolen from me. And if you've ever had anything stolen from you when you were in school, I, I guess I have to make this relevant to the show in the 80s, uh, the worst thing was in school when you'd see the kid the punk bastard who stole your item with your item and you went, give it back to me. And he goes, always the same thing. I got this from home. I got this from home, man. It was my Swatch watch, had my Swatch guard on it. I got this from home. Had my teeth marks in it because I would always chew on the Swatch watch band. Uh, and uh, and it, would, it was the worst thing when people, kids would steal your pens and be like, I got it from home. The worst. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. I want to get you to sign a guest release. Okay.